information system, your aims. So you identify everybody who is playing a role in the use of the system. They could be making use of the data coming out of the system, or they could be supplying information into the system. So you also need to, in the process of uh, showing the overview, the current operation of the system, you would also have to indicate how your system is currently situated. And that would be done using the data flow diagram of the current system. This illustrates the current processes and technologies being used to transform inputs into outputs. Here, the benefit of using DFDs of the current system is to help you to analyze the current operations and help you to understand what are the gaps and challenges that are currently being, organ being experienced in the organization. Once you understand the current overview of the system, it's easy for you to propose and come up with a good, accurate solution to counter the challenges that you can observe in the current system. So from the DFDs of current system, you move on to DFDs, DFD, that is data flow diagrams of new logical system. Remember, you could have a system that is already in place, but it might turn out that it's manual and you're trying to introduce a new information, a new, a new system, which is software based. So here you're looking at a new logical system, which is techno technology independent. It basically shows you the data flows, the structure and functional requirements of the new system. And so for you to come up with DFDs of the new logical system, you have to have you have to determine the requirements or use the requirements definition statement because it is in that statement that you're able to indicate what functionalities should go into the system and those functionalities are linked to the processes that would go into building the new system so that is your dfd for the new system then you've got a project dictionary and case repository, which contains entries for objects in all diagrams. Remember, you're going to be drawing different diagrams and in different levels. So you need to have a repository or a definition of all components that go into the diagram. So what's the difference? I talked about a flow chart being an example of a process modeling tool. So what's the difference between data flows and flow charts? Processes on a data flow can operate in parallel at the same time, while processes on flow charts execute one at a time. Like I said, in a flow chart, if you use the example of withdrawing money at an ATM, it, it, it basically follows a flow chart system. If you go to withdraw, money unless you're done with the withdrawal you cannot begin another activity for instance you go enter your pin that's the first step then you will see a window that gives you different options withdraw deposit check balance print statement all these are different activities at your atm dispose at your atm if you want to deposit, you're going to first do the deposit transaction before you do a withdrawal. You cannot run those two activities concurrently. So you find that that very, uh, that ATM system, for that component at the ATM, you cannot do, you, it cannot have different functions running at the same time. Because unless you're done with your withdrawal, you cannot go to deposit. If you deposit your money, the balance must reflect the new amount. And if you're to withdraw, let's say if you deposited 50,000 and you want to withdraw 100,000, your system, that ATM must update the record so that you don't go and withdraw money that is more than your current available balance. So that's why it uses a system whereby 
you, the processes are executed one at a time. And I've given you the example of the ATM. Number two, DFD show the flow of data through a system. For instance, you're able to show, you're able to, okay, just give me a minute. If you could just give me a second. Let me just sort out a few things. Just give me a second. Hello, um, hello there, hope you're still there. Agava, are you people still there? Hello, Dr. Wayne. Okay, all right, so, so sorry about that, but uh, you know, let's continue. So I was explaining the differences between DFDs and flow charts. So I say DFDs show the flow of data through a system while flowcharts show the flow of control or sequence and transfer of control. For instance, the example of the ATM, um, you can only see that unless you've done the deposit and the account has been updated, you cannot withdraw an amount that is beyond what is available in your account. So you've got, it, it has to show the different sequence of activities that's in a flowchart. Processes on a data flow can have dramatically different timings, daily, weekly, on demand. 
That is, you might have a function in your system where every week you're having reports or every day people are accessing the system or monthly marks are being entered. So anyway, there are different activities that are going on and you can have different timings for them. While processes on a flow chart are part of a summer program with consistent timing, for instance, a single program could be deposits. That is a program that does deposits in the ATM system or withdrawals. These ones are part of that single program. So once this is done, it's run and executed. Once the deposit is done, there should be a way of updating your account immediately and making sure that the account balance is up to date. So, and so you'll have, even when a withdrawal is done, immediately you withdraw. If you had 50,000, you withdraw 20,000. Again, the system runs up to the very end and make sure that an update is put in your system so that you're not, you do not go back to the ATM 10 minutes later and again, put in the same request of withdrawing 20,000 even when you have less available balance. So that is how our flowcharts work. So anyway, the advantage of, of process, of process uh, data flows is that you're able to see the different activities taking place concurrently, not just one at a time. So data flow analysis attempts to answer four specific questions. So data flow analysis is based on data flow diagramming or data flow diagrams. And what's the aim? The aim is for you to know um, how to structure your system. And in order to structure your system, you need to answer four basic questions. You need to know what processes make up a system. And how do you know what processes make up a system? you would have to refer back to the requirements definition statement. That's where you find all the functionalities, all the processes that define your system. You also need to know what data is used in each process. Again, that will be answered if you get back to that requirements definition statement. And during your requirements determination process, you were asking questions like what processes are done, what, what are the kind of activities that take place here, what data has been supplied to the system. So for you to know what data goes into the, each process, you need to refer back to the information you gathered during your requirements determination. You need to know what data is stored. What data is stored is determined by the kind of information that you need to retrieve. So when you get to the point of uh, structuring your requirements, if you remember, there were two categories of functional requirements. We had information-oriented requirements and process-oriented requirements. So with the information-oriented requirements, you need to know what data is going to be used later on. And so that is the data that is stored in your system. You also need to know what data enters and leaves the system. That will also be linked to who is using the system, what they're using it for, and what sort of output they expect. For instance, if an output is an ID card or an examination card or registration card, for you to print those details out, those cards out, you need some data to have been entered into the system. So data flow analysis basically has to do with understanding how data is used in the system and for which activity. And also it has to do with understanding the kind of documents which are flown through your system and graphically. So that is data, documentation, information flowing through your system. And so to construct that kind of graphical view, you would need to use certain symbols. So these symbols you see on that slide represent the four uh, diagramming symbols for drawing data flow diagrams. So what you see here on the left-hand side is a tool diagramming tools by DiMarco and Yoden. And then what you see on your right-hand side is Gain Isason. Both of them can be used, but if you decide to use the oval to represent your process and the open-ended rectangle to represent your data store, you must remain consistent because if you decide to use 
the rounded corner square and then a rectangle closed on one end you must remain consistent because if you may notice that for source and sink they are the same data flows also remain the same the only difference is coming in the symbol that represents the process and symbol that represents the data store so whichever you decide to use you must remain consistent for instance if you decide to use the oval don't decide that you want to use the close ends triangle uh, rectangle it must be oval for process open-ended rectangle for your data store or a rounded corner square for your process and one side open for your data store and tell the section that gives you the label for the data store so those are your symbols so take note of them because you're going to use them so here they are in detail you've got to label your process as you can see there either rounded square or oval shaped you've got to label your process you've got the data flow label your data flow you've got a data store as you can see you label your data store d1 name it or d1 name it every entity has got to be labeled and that's what you see there so as you may notice here data flows are they look the same the arrows look the same for both categories or the external entities also look the same the only difference comes in in the process and data store so you can take note of that so those dft terms and symbols represent the process which our data store or source or sync and data flow data flow is data in motion data store is the place where data is kept you would have to determine already which kind of data you want to store and how you're going to store it source sync represent the out the the people who are interacting with the system are called external entities the process shows the transition that takes place or the transformation being subjected to the data that is entering the system. So you're going to use data flow diagrams to define the, define the business processes. And in doing that, you're going to use the element or the principle of decomposition. So business processes are too complex to be explained in one data flow. Remember when we started, I told you about the initial diagram that shows you the overview of how your system is situated within the environment and the kind of entities that are interacting with it. Now that is over like generic view, but then because systems are so big and complex, they need to be, um, structured or broken down into smaller units so those smaller units are broken down using the principle of decomposition so what is decomposition decomposition is one of the characteristics or some of the the, the principles that governs data flow diagramming and it involves breaking down a system into smaller components why do you do that it's because you want to manage the bigger system because smaller units are easily manageable it's easy for you to focus your attention to one specific sub process or module once you have that completely de de uh, completely developed or coded you can test it run it test it and find out whether there are still any issues or errors that exist so you find through decomposition, you're able to manage your system. You're able to concentrate your focus on a given area. And then you can also be able to assign different modules to different people so that each one can focus on a specific module. And so here you find that you're able to build different components at independent times. If you say you've broken down a system like eCampus to a module for marks or printing transcripts to one that captures marks, 
one that registers students, another that uh, synchronizes fees. You find groups of people can be working on different modules or different components at the same concurrently. So it's easy for you to decentralize the development of your system. And so that's one of the benefits of decomposition of DFDs. So what you see here is what you would go through as you're breaking down your system. So the initial stage as you begin to draw your, content, your data flows is the context diagram. Like I said, the context diagram shows you how the system you're developing is situated and interacting with its environment and it shows you the entities that are interacting with it. So the example here is with the context diagram at the top there, you've got entity A, entity B, and you have your information system. It is the first diagram that you would be drawing as you begin to model or structure your system or, or structure your requirements. So here you have, that's a context, that's a very simple. You have entity A, just X as a data flow, Y as a data flow. If you see those, the direction of the arrows, from A to the information system, you have X. So which shows you that data is flowing from entity A into the system. Now on the other side, Y, it's on facing the left. It basically means information is leaving the information system and going back to the entity. When you look at entity B, Z is a label for your data flow. It shows you that information is leaving the information system and going to entity B. So that is just a simple illustration of what a context diagram would look like. One thing you should also remember is that a context diagram does not include data stores. It basically shows you the major entities that your system is interacting with and the one information system that you intend to develop. So if we could replace information system with e-campus system, that would be your label there. But within the e-campus system, there are many stakeholders interacting. According to this diagram, there are just two. But if we take the example of the e-campus system, you would have entity A to represent students, entity B to represent lecturers, entity C to represent academic registrar or faculty registrar, entity D to represent heads of departments and deans, entity maybe E to represent uh, administrators or the bank. That if you decide that the banking system is going to be just linked to that. So you'd have a system banking system linked to your e-campus system. So here, this example just has two entities, A and B. Why? Because probably the system, the kind of system it represents has just two entities. But where you have more than two entities, you have to indicate all of them and show the interactions that are taking place between the entities and the system. And that is just overview. How the information system is situated within its environment. So once you have your context diagram drawn, during decomposition, you're going to break it down. So here, it's like having the example that we had from defining our functional and non-functional requirements. A user could have said, I want a system that will help me uh, conf uh, confirm schedule appointments is one. You could have another one that says, you could have another one that says, um, you could have another system that says, so one is uh, confirm, uh, schedule client appointments. Another one could be place new orders. Another one could be print uh, print ID cards. Another one could be generate reports. All these represent what users want. But once you have what users want, you now need to break them down into how each of those can be realized. But then one major system could be sales 
maybe a human resource or no appointment scheduling system. That could be a kind of system, maybe appointment scheduling system, or it could be invoicing, sales and invoicing system, or it could be uh, a sales order tracking system, or it could be uh, a hospital patient records management system. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you will always have a definition of the specifics that go into that system. And that's where you have that decomposed or broken down into the different processes. So here you have from just one process called information systems. You now have process T, process U, process V, three of them. The entities remain the same. So one thing you need to keep in mind is that when you're drawing your context diagram, you need to be to exhaust all the entities that would be interacting with your system. Why is it so? Because when you come to decomposing your system, you have to maintain the number that appears in your context diagram must remain the same. You will not introduce a new entity just because you have many more processes running through your system. If you started with two entities, you've got to maintain those number of entities. If you started with three or four, that's what you maintain throughout your process of decomposing your data flows. Even the data stores have to remain the same. If at level zero, you introduce a new a data store, you call it D1. You cannot begin introducing a new data store at D2, at, at, uh, at level one. What you had at level zero as your data store, remember in your context diagram, you're not showing or you do not need to include the data stores. So the first time you see any data store is at level zero. So whatever data store you include at level zero, it must remain consistent throughout your process of decomposing your data flow diagram. So as you see in level one, from level one, you basically look at level one is based on the processes you identify at level zero that require further breaking down. For instance, now you had from zero in context diagram, you have three processes. But then along the way, you get to know that process two, which is you, actually needs to be broken down further. So this is a point where you now look at a level one data flow. So level zero is what you begin with after you've drawn your context diagram. Level one is what you draw after you've identified a specific process in level zero that requires breaking down. So in this example, you identified process two. Process two is now broken down further into 2.1. So as you can see, the numbering is dependent on which process you are breaking down. Let's take an example that uh, it was process three, which is process V, that you're breaking down. Level one for process three would be 3.1 process D, 3.2 process E, 3.3 process F, and then you have the accompanying data store. But in this case, for the example we have here, it is two, which is process U, that requires to be broken down. So you have 2.1 with process D. It shows you the input, the outflows and outflows and inflows. So you have 2.1 process D, 2.2 process E, 2.3 process F. So the number of processes that you're introducing when you break down your system is dependent on the activities you've identified during your defin definition of your functionalities. Whatever you have in your functional requirements definition statement is what you're going to include in the decompositions because you don't want to introduce something that is outside of what you've defined. Now process devil 2 dfd is based on whatever was at level one in terms of processes that requires further breaking down. For instance, 2.2 here associated with process E is is to be broken down. And as it's broken down, you introduce 2.21 is process K. It flows into 2.2 process L. Process L feeds R into 2.23. 
process M, and it's stored into D1, N and M. C is going back to another process. D here, G is also going back to another process. K is input coming from a previous process that you will have identified in the previous level. So what you see there is that for you to number a new level, it's based on the previous numbering. You cannot say you're introducing level two and level two is looking at decomposing a process on level zero. No, that is not right. That's not correct. If you want, to, if you still have another process at level zero that you'd like to decompose, like in this example, it was process two, which is labeled process U. It's the one that we've decomposed. Let's say if you wanted to decompose one, which is labeled process T, you would have to create another level one data flow diagram and you would have to label it for process one. Why? Because each of those processes is having different activities taking place and you'd like to um, differentiate those activities by not um, by not joining up the different processes. That's why you would have to have a different diagram labeled level one DFD for process one, in case it's process one that you're looking at decomposing. So what do you, if you're asking a question like, so how do I know how to number them? The numbering is based on the, the level at which it was, and it's also based on the process that you're decomposing. If it's a process that was, if it's a process that is associated with level zero, the next level would be level one. It doesn't matter how many processes at level zero need decomposing. You would have different level ones for them, as long as you're focusing on processes on level zero. But if you're not looking at processes at level one, if there are two processes that need to be decomposed, those two processes have got to be labeled. So here, you've got level two DFT for process 2.2, .2, that is one. If there's another 2.3 also that requires decomposing, you'd have a label like level two DFT for process 2.3. So what does it tell you? It tells you that each, each time you move to a new level, that new level is the, what goes into it is based on the previous level. And so, for as long as you have many processes from the previous level that require decomposing, then you will have to lay, to come up with the level DFD based on the previous, and then it would be for each process that requires decomposing. So let's say if you want to decompose process 2.2, and you're looking at a specific process like 2.22, 2.22, you would now call it level three DFT for process 2.2.2. It is now called level three. Some of you are thinking that maybe it's called level 1.2 because you're looking at decomposing one, process one from level zero. No, it is for as long as you have many processes from the previous level that require processing, you just take it the previous level was one and there's one that requires decomposing. The next would be labeled as level two. You cannot begin again renaming level one because you've decomposed that level. It is based on what you have that now you introduce a new level because you're breaking it down. All right, so now let's move further. You will take time to just go through that, but that's just an example. We're not going to go into detail of drawing our context diagrams. So how do you draw a context diagram? A context diagram is a data flow diagram depicting the scope of an organizational system that shows the system boundaries, external entities that interact with the system, and the major information flows between the entities and the system. So if you look, it shows basically the entire system in context within its environment. And it's always just one process, and it shows the data flows and just the, the entities that are connected to it. So, um, 
Yeah. So let's see how it's done. So there is an example of a context diagram. It's called a food ordering system. So from what I've been explaining, I'd like us now to, to interact. May we interact now? This is a context diagram and it's labeling the process as a food ordering system. Can somebody just help us explain what they're seeing on their screen? Just to make sure that we are following. Agaba, Semogere, Mkalazi, Sivaidu, Nuamanya. Can somebody just try to explain what they see on the screen? What you're seeing on the screen. Just explain what you perceive from the diagram and how the arrows are flowing. What do you Hello. understand? Hello? Is that, uh, is it? This is Birunji Johan. Birunji Johan, yes, please. Can you speak to this diagram? Tell us what you understand. Um, from this point, I see mm. a customer comes and makes an mm. order. After yes. making order, the kitchen department will be notified and the customer will come. Yeah. The kitchen, the, the food order will be sent to the kitchen. That means mm. this customer will be served the food. After that, the manager, the, man, the restaurant manager will, will no. So a customer will come, place an order. Mm. After then, the food will be taken to the kitchen. Yes. So that means the customer will be served whatever he ordered for. And yeah. then that customer will be given a receipt. Mm. Then after that, the receipt will be sent to the restaurant manager. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think you followed. So that is it. So you see, the data, the, where the arrows are, also represent where the, the data or information is originating from and where it's ending up. So that's what you see there. So you have just remember, like I said in a context diagram, you have just one process. And that is one process you've seen that the process is called food ordering system, or the system for which you're designing the system is called food ordering system. And as you can see, there are three entities. There's a customer, there's a restaurant manager, there's the kitchen. Can we, can you uh, identify the sources and destinations of sinks? Which ones are the sources and which are the sinks? Can somebody help us identify the source and the, and the sink? Agava? Yes, Doctor. <laughs> yeah, uh, Can somebody identify the source and, and think external entities? Uh, maybe we, uh, if, if you could help us and first uh, elaborate more about the sink, eh? so that we get to know what it means, then we can differentiate between the two. <laughs> but I already explained it. Didn't I? Okay, maybe let me just explain the way I understood. Eh? Now, okay. uh, for the source, for the source, mm. it could be the customer. And then when uh, when we go to the sink, I think that is now the end part of it, or the, des the destination, if I can maybe try to simplify it in that way. 
And that, that one mm. can be the restaurant manager. Mm. And maybe even the kitchen. Okay, so maybe you can explain for you. You've not even explained like the way you said, explaining what you mean by source and what's the difference between source and sink. Because you're you're on spot, you're, you're you're correct on point, correct. However, for the benefit of those who don't understand the differences, could you explain? Well, uh, I think the the, the source uh, that is where everything is just starting from. So, for this case, uh, taking just that example, we look at a customer. Mm. This person, uh, mm. everything is just beginning with the customer because mm. he comes, he or she comes, and he presses mm. his order. So, uh, mm. when I look at the other part of the sink is. The final mm. destination, where is the process going to end from? It will end on mm. the restaurant manager who is going to receive, mm. uh, to get the receipts or the reports that, has, uh, that have come from the customer because uh, the customer will press his or her order, then the order will be taken to the kitchen, they'll bring food for that person, then after they mm. give him or her a receipt to clarify uh, like his payments and everything so that there is no, maybe any other excuse or anything. Then after mm. that, that receipt will be taken to the restaurant manager, which is the destination. It is the, uh, to this case, it is the end of the process. It is, it ends there. So mm. now that one is what I'm clarifying as the sink, the sink, the end, the end point of the whole process. Mm. Yeah, so to me, I think that's how I can explain it. Maybe if there is somebody to add on something. Mm. Uh, I Yes, unless they've not really understood, but I believe that explanation has really been just okay. All right, so if this is clear, we can move on to the next slide. So from your context diagram here, as you can see the sink, basically a sink is a person who is making use of data that has undergone transition from the system well a, uh, a source is a person supplying data into the system so for the the restaurant is running because of the customer so the customer is the source and while the manager and the kitchen are the sinks because they can only prepare food in the kitchen when the customer walks in or the manager can needs to know about how many customers they received on a specific day. You can only receive that report after customers have come and the system picks up whoever has visited the restaurant and the kind of foods they've eaten. Okay, so the next step is for you to identify processes embedded in the single process. So here you just have one process. You have a data flow labeled customer order, you have another data flow labeled receipt, another data flow labeled food order, and another labeled management reports. With just one process, you've got to break it down by identifying the processes embedded within that single process. So if you say you want a food ordering system, what processes go into you're running that system. That's what you need to know. So you need to have already conducted the uh, done a requirements definition. And to do your requirements definition statement, you need to have gone to investigate what the clients want with their system. Once you have that, you also need to know the kind of data that is being stored in that system. Once all this is identified, then you go on to draw what is called a level zero data flow diagram. Level zero data flow diagram shows all the major high level processes. We're talking about the major high level processes. And usually, just to give you a tip, usually these are linked to the major functions that the user wants to see in that system. So here, your level zero would show 
all the processes at first level of numbering. First level of numbering, if you know, if you're familiar with word and you've done word processing before, when you come to numbering or you're doing, running, a, generating a table of content, you would find that you're, you're starting a section heading, you begin at section one. And the label number that would be associated with would be at level zero, which would be 1.0, there's an introduction. 2.0, maybe background. 3.0, maybe um, literature review or it could be a topic that you're interested in. The topic could be like systems analysis. 4.0 could be another topic like system design. All these are first level numbering. Then if you begin having a discussion within your introduction, you do 1.1 objectives, 1.2 um, goal, 1.3 research questions, 1.4 summary, all this is second level so i'm bringing this to try to throw more light on this that at level zero diagram you're numbering at the first level of numbering which means you're taking number 1.0 that is a an independent process you're taking 2.0 another independent process 3.0 another process 4.0 another one 5.0 that's another one. So that's what you'd expect to see at level zero. It is at the first level. When you move on to the next level, then you're going to second level of numbering, which would be derived from the first level. So if you had 1.0, for you to now decompose it further, you're no longer looking at 1.0, but you're now looking at the derived processes of 1.0. So you'd have 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, and so on and so forth. So let's see. This is your level zero context diagram. What you see there is first level numbering for the major processes that you think about your system achieving in terms of functionality. You, as you can see, the entities remain the same. We have customer, kitchen, restaurant manager. Now I can clearly see, and if you can also agree with me, one process zero called food ordering system is no longer there. What now you see are the high level processes at the first level of numbering derived from breaking down the food ordering system into major functions or activities that will help you achieve the, the process of, de of, of, of developing the food ordering system. So what you see here is a 1.0, receive and transform customer food order. What comes to mind? It means if you're interacting with the food ordering system, the first step is going to be for you to receive in transform, transform customer food order. You're going to walk in as a customer. You want to eat food. For you to eat that food, you need to supply information about the kind of food you want. That is your order. Through that system, that could be somewhere within the reception, somebody receives your order. Obviously, you're not going to go to the kitchen somebody is going to interface with you and once they receive your order your order is sent to the kitchen and that's why you see another data flow labeled food order the receipt there basically shows two things one they acknowledge that you have received your food once your order has been taken basically shows that you've received your food secondly it also shows that a transaction from both ends has taken place. In other words, for you to get the food, you've made the payment. You're not going to eat the food for free. Even if you decide to pay after eating, basically for the receipt to take place or the data to flow back to your receipt, it basically confirms that you've received, paid, the food has been uh, prepared, and you're receiving it. 
So 1.0 labeled receive and transport transform customer food order. But if you may notice there, there are now two arrows leaving 1.0. The first one is going to 2.0. Another one is going to 3.0. We've introduced two more processes. 2.0 labeled update goods sold file. And the data flow there is saying goods sold data. The goods there is the food you've ordered. So if you've ordered chips and chicken, how much is it half plate, half chips, half chicken? Is it a whole chicken and big chips? Is it a, um, is it a small portion takeaway? Is it plain chips? Whatever it is you've done, they already have categorizations in the system. And so the system would, once your order is captured, as the order is going to the kitchen, this information is also going to update the good sold file. Why? Because at the end of it all, the manager needs to keep track of what's taking place. So 2.0 is a process that helps update goods sold. So here, formatted goods sold data is sent to the goods sold file. That goods sold file will con 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 consist of information about what has been eaten. And so maybe you've designed it in such a way that for each item you've ordered, there's already a pre-existing template that captures the amount that would have, uh, would have taken. For instance, if you decide to do half chicken, half chips, there's amount for it. So already it is pre-selected. Once it's pre-selected, an update is sent. So the person who is receiving your order does not have to do a lot. It simply is updated automatically. That, that file stores that information. So at the end of it, at the end of the day, it's easy to pick up those records. On this side too, there's inventory data. Update inventory file. So if you had, if doing chips on that specific day, they had to buy one kilogram. Okay, let's put it for the sake of 10 kilograms of Irish potatoes. And then one kilogram, one, one whole chicken of 25,000 or a chicken of 35,000, but it could be measured in kilos. It could be a chicken of two kilograms, a chicken of five kilograms, a chicken of 10 kilograms. Now, why is it important to also supply inventory data? It's because once somebody has placed an order for, let's say, half chips, half chicken, that is associated with uh, an amount in terms of a weight. So if that weight consists of, let's say, a half a kilogram, and the chips also consist of a half a kilogram, it means out of the inventory of what you have in stock, out of your purchase, or if on that day you purchased a five kilogram piece of chicken, and you also purchased five kilograms of Irish potatoes, and you received an order, somebody has taken half chips, which is equivalent to half kilogram, and half chicken, which is equivalent to maybe half a kilogram. For this data to be updated, already it will go into record that out of the existing five kilograms of chicken, already half has been eaten. So if half has been eaten, it means the inventory will update to say the current available amount of chicken is four and a half kilograms. And also if the chicken eaten is equivalent to, I mean, the Irish is equivalent to half, half, half a kilogram, it will also go to update the available Irish potatoes are maybe 9.5 kilograms. So when you keep on receiving more orders, you're able to already tell that what you have in store is either enough to serve more clients or it has run out. That's why you know that if you bought five pieces of chicken, before somebody, if somebody is ordering already, already the system will update that you've run out of chicken. 
So they will tell you kindly order for something else, order for liver, order for meat, order for maybe ducky, duck, or any other uh, foods they might have. So you find that an update is going to the inventory file, an update is also going to the sold. Why? Because you need to know how much money you're, so you're making. You also need to know how much you still have in store. So both are going to store data in a data store. And as you can see, D2 here is labeled good sold file. And D1 is labeled inventory file. The manager is now interested in this data. He might not be at the reception because you have a receptionist there. He might not be at the kitchen because you have a chef there, master chef. So his role is basically, basically to look at balance books and look at how you're doing business. So for him, he wants to see reports. How much have we made in the past three hours? How much do we still have in the store? Because if the commodities are running out, already he would have to go and buy more, more supplies. Or at the end of the day, he would need to know how much you sold and how much money is coming into the business. By doing that, you're able to forecast the performance of the business. So you find 4.0 as a process that produces management reports. is going to go and pick information from the data stores and one on one side is daily goods sold amounts on the other side is daily inventory depletion amounts all are supplying information into the process 4.0 which is produce management reports once you have that process you now go on to supplying that report to the manager so the some rules that govern decomposition and drawing of arrows and labeling. You're going to see that. So at this point, we are looking at four processes. If you move on to level one, this is now level zero DFG food ordering system. If you move on to the next step, step four, Decompose level zero DFT. This is level zero DFT. And as you can see, the numbering is 1.0, 3.0, 2.0, 4.0, with the data stores introduced and the three entities. If you go to your next diagram, decomposing that, you're going to, for each level zero process, for each 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. For each of them, you're going to identify the sub process that needs to be performed to complete that process. For instance, if you were to think about it, what do I need to produce management reports, you think? What do I need in the process of receiving and transforming customer orders? What do I need in updating the inventory file? So when you think about it, that will help you now to identify the sub-processes. Identify key data stores along the identified sub-processes. Then draw the processes level one diagram. So how would that look like? So your level one DFD would look like this. This one is clearly lab labeled. Level one data flow showing the data. So our process 1.0, is that one there? It says receive and transform customer order. If you look at it, it has an input from customer called labeled customer order and it has an output, two outputs, three actually, three outputs, four outputs from 1.0. One is called receipt, two is called food order to the kitchen, five, uh, three, is called inventory data to another process. Four, good sold file, good, good sold data to process 2.0. So let's look at this. I'd like you to spend a few minutes, just get acquainted with that diagram. Just look at it. 
look at it spend about four minutes just looking at it and then we shall we shall talk about it Okay, so I, I believe um, most of, you've all looked at it and um, you're getting familiar with what we're talking about, decomposition. Can we get somebody just to speak to this diagram and just tell us what they understand, what is not clear, and maybe enlighten those who could be short of understanding and maybe the taking is taking them time to get acquainted with what we are doing with decomposition. Agaba, would you like to give it a go? Or oh, I'll just uh, call out randomly somebody, let's say somebody from Chabona, Chabona or Guson. Gusongoire, Gusongoire. <laughs> oh, Nuamanya. Oh, somebody should just volunteer. Uh, all right, Doctor. I think let me just be the first person to talk about it, then uh, others will also maybe come and put their contributions there. Uh, well, according to hey, me, okay, so you have somebody who wants to talk? Yes. To us? Yes, yes. Hey. Hello. Okay, so back to, okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, I was saying that according to me, how I've really understood this diagram, uh, the whole process, it all begins from the customer. Now, when the customer comes, uh, the customer presses in his order. That is now when we move to that section of 1.1, it is received customer order. Mm -hmm. Now, after receiving, the, uh, after receiving the customer mm. order, uh, that, mm. that order... So what is that? Yes? 
one point one. What do you call it? I want you to use the real meanings for each of the labels you're seeing. So one point one is receive customer order. What is that? Is it a new? What is it? What do you call it? In 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 terms of data flow diagramming language. Hmm. Agab, are you still there? What's going on? Isn't it a process? Yes, it is, but it is a sub process. It is a sub process, a sub -process yes, because from 1.0, which was a major process, high level process, now we are a sub process. And that's why from 1.0 now you have a 1.1. So there you have 1.1 sub process receive customer order. Okay, go on. Yes, uh, now from that 1.1, thank you for that yes. point of correction. Uh, mm. That 1.1 is a sub process uh, which is receive mm. customer order. Now, uh, after, the, the, mm. after the customer has placed an order, that order is, uh, it, it moves to yes. 1.2, because it is now, the, the, uh, now uh, it has two arrows. One moves to 1.3, another moves to 1.2. Mm. Now, after the mm. customer has placed an order, it moves also to that sub mm. process of generate customer receipt. Mm. Now they know what the customer wants, so they have to generate yes. for or her a receipt. Yes. And now, after uh but remember his order it has also to be taken up to the kitchen to get what uh get for him what they what he wants i mean yes. that's what we move to that sub process of 1.3 which is a transform yes. order kitchen format mm. now the order is pressed there in the kitchen so now when we come back to uh that 1.1 that sub process of 1.1 uh there is that customer order that moves to 1.5 Mm. Yeah, because the, uh, I'm, I'm following the arrows, how the arrows are moving. Eh? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, from 1.1, it moves to mm. 1.5. I've finished 1.2 and 1.3. So moving to 1.5, mm. uh, they should generate inventory decrements. Mm. Now, uh, the same from the same sub-process, it also moves to 1.4, which says uh, generate good sold increments. Now, mm. after... Uh, from that sub process of 1.1, the uh, the good sold in, uh, to generate the good sold increments, it means that uh, so far the good uh, after the customer has placed an order, then they can be able to determine the goods which are going to be taken. For mm. this case, if he has already placed an order, then there they can mm. determine what that person is going to take, so they can easily mm. generate from that sub process 1.4 then still mm. on that sub process of 1.5 generating mm. the increment they uh, they generate uh they try to see through and see uh which one has been taken and which one is remaining now mm. they are able to determine what something that has been already taken and something that can uh, that, that could be remaining and from the mm. sub process 1.5 it moves to mm. sub 3.0 Mm. Now, moving to sub process 3.0, it is coming mm. from uh, sub process 1.5, which says update inventory file. Updating, it means they have to see through and get to know what is remaining there and what has been taken. I think that is updating. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And from sub process 1.4, it moves to uh, good sold data, which is sub process 2.0. Update good mm. sold file. I don't know whether that one is okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, it's mm. fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, mm. as as 2.0, they say update good sold file. Updating mm. good sold, uh, it means they have to go in, uh, into the system and they see the goods which have been sold. Then, mm. from the, uh, from that file, they update what has already been uh, sold. Mm. And I think that is uh, the end. That is the end of the process. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think that, that yes, that's for level that's one, for only doing. Why do we see? Why do we see three point zero and two point two point zero and three point zero here? Basically, we're just showing you could actually do without them, but because this particular process, sub process 1.1 1 .1 is going to feed process 3.0 while process 1.4 is going to feed information into process 2.0 that is why you introduce them here but you cannot begin decomposing 3.0 and 2.0 at this point they simply just receive information from the processes in process 1.0 without you decomposing them. So at this point, this will just be sufficient. It's just enough to show that output from process 1.5 is input into process 3.0, while output from 1.4 is going to be input into process 2.0. So that is it. So thank you, Agaba. You've done so well. That has been a good explanation. I believe the rest were able to follow what your, your explanations have been. So at this point, I'd like to give you, um, okay, so let's move on to this slide. If somebody can pick up from, this is also a decomposition, it's called level one diagram for process 4.0. After we've gotten the explanation for this, I would like to give you an activity right now. An activity, but after I've gotten a volunteer to explain this particular diagram. It is a level one diagram showing the decomposition of process 4.0. If you go, can go back to our diagram here, 4.0 is labeled produce management reports. That is process 4.0. We are decomposing it. So here, this is how it looks like. Can somebody try to explain that so that we get into the activity? And I would like to check with you, Agaba. Um, you're in the lab, and uh, you've been permitted to be there up to what time so that uh, we can plan our time accordingly? Up to seven. Up to seven. <laughs> You're supposed to stop at seven? Yes. OK. Can I get somebody to explain this diagram quickly? Then I'll leave you that that task to do uh, quickly, because I, I need to just be sure that you're following through with this discussion. Uh, huh. uh good evening good evening to you good evening well, this good is evening yes good good is, this is good yeah, but 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 you can call me guso if 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 you don't mind uh, so okay. no, basically it sounds heavy hold so on, hold process on, eh? 4.0 uh, here on, we're trying to on, decompose a process 4.0 like what happens in uh, in preparing the management reports eh? or, or what is needed for the management reports so we are being shown that um we are not following i don't know about the rest huh? i don't know about the rest oh dear so what was going on with him because um there's a lot of noise in the background. Hello, madam. Is it there with you? No. Hello? no. <coughs> He's not there, but let me try. Okay. Yes. So we are saying that we have here, like, let me call it. Who them. is that? Joan. Is that a Joan? Yes. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so we are seeing like we have, let me call them databases and we say they are data load them anyway. You see they are so, called data stores. Okay, data stores. So data have, stores. 
we have these two data stores, like one is for goods store, and we had inventory also. So we get our data from the inventory and the data from the goods sold. We try mm. to store them. That is for one access the goods sold and inventory data. Mm. And when we get that data, we add the sold and the inventory data. That is for two. Yes, if we get that data, it's like studying it and coming up mm -hmm. with an aggregate data. So mm. this data is used to prepare a report that is mm. now for of which this report will be forwarded to the manager. Mm. Yes. Okay, so 4.1. So what's the reason of having 4.1 and 4.2? Do you know? So I think... Having 4.1, basically you're getting this data from two different data stores and you're trying to, mm -hmm. it's called like balancing. What do we have and what have we sold? Mm. Yes, so you you somehow start there and do the balancing. Mm. Then after doing that, you know we've sold five sodas, Maybe it will remaining. So I guess that's how just to start and balance them what have been sold, how much have we gone, mm. what something like that. And after that, we generate mm. a report from the data. Good. The one you're using. I can imagine with different lecturers supply information about your results, Elect your, your course for information systems and design, another course maybe for object-oriented programming, another course maybe networks and management or networks and security. So imagine all these are independent files. Now, these files need to be aggregated so that you have one template, one view of your overall mark. So that one view of your overall mark would be processed through the results processing, uh, through, through a process that um, picks all the results from the different course units, aggregates them, then goes on to compute your GPA. So that GPA once is computed for each of the course units, it goes on to present results in form of, in a tabular form, in form of a transcript that will contain all the course units, the final mark, the GPA, and the cumulative grade point average for that for a specific student. So to do that, you'd have to have functions, create a sub-functions, want to fetch records from the data store, stored for each course unit, another to process and aggregate, another to assign GPAs, then a final view in form of a transcript is created. And that transcript is viewed by the student. So if a student goes to your e-campus system and they want to, they say, generate transcript, in the background, all these functions and sub-functions or sub-processes come into action and they produce a result for the student. And that would be your transcript as a final report. On the other hand, a dean or head of department might also want to know the performance of students in a given department or in a given faculty. Maybe they need to know how many students had a GPA of first class or second class, second class upper, second class lower and pass. All these can be generated in reports, but to do that, the system needs to be doing a lot of activities in the different sub-functions to generate the different categories of kind of reports that would be required and then aggregated into a simple function or one function. All right. So at this point, I'm going to give you a task that I'd like you to start on now and you'll finish it up when we catch up on Monday. You'll present your results rather when we catch up on Monday. For now, I'd like to refer you to these three things from here. 
if you can see that slide, which is level zero DFT for the food ordering system. You move on to the level one DFD for process 1.0, DFD for process 4.0. Of course, there's also level two here. I'd like you to, I'd like you to take some time and think about converting what you see here into a requirement definition statement. I'd like to bring you back to le uh, lecture four. In this lecture four, if you go to slide, slide 11 or something, If you go to slide, your requirements definition statement, you see that slide 19. I'd like you to do a requirements definition statement and do it before the food ordering system. Here it's labeled holiday travel vehicles. But it would be a requirements definition statement for the food ordering system. These are non-functional requirements, and we have functional requirements. Like we said, the first level at the first level of numbering would be the major processes at level zero. So I want you to come up with these listings of all the functional requirements with the first level numbering second level numberings based on the diagrams that you've seen. Whatever appears in those process diagrams we've just discussed, I'd like you to come up with a document like this one that clearly defines your functional requirements at first level, second level, and third level, and also non-functional requirements that would go into that kind of system. I'd like you to start on it now, but given that we have just five minutes to seven, you should be winding up now, I believe. You're going to spend the weekend just working on that. And first thing on Monday when we meet, each of you is going to be presenting. You'll share your screen. You can do it in handwritten or just type it out. But each of you will have a chance to showcase what you've come up with. Because by doing that, it will help me to know whether you're learning what we what we are discussing. And so that's what that's your take home for tonight and for the weekend work on that we'll now look at it and you present whatever you've come up with on monday is that clear agaba yes doctor yeah there is somebody who has a question here before maybe we wrap up okay let them ask Yes, Doctor, I wanted to ask what's the difference between the data store and the data dictionary? A data dictionary is used while you're doing um, your data modeling or data store. I mean, data modeling or system design. Basically, it shows you the major components that define your database. It's actually the actual design on how data is stored within the system. When it comes to process modeling, we are representing the kind of data that you intend. You, you, I hope you're clearly following the words I'm using, intend, the kind of data store you intend to store in your system. While when it comes to system design, you actually talk about the, uh, the storage that you're going to be reserving in memory for that data store. So let me give an example. In designing, in designing a, a database, 